If you have a Bible today, or if you have a way to access your Bible, we're going to be in the 11th chapter of Mark's Gospel, and we're beginning a, a new series today, uh, all through the study of this great Gospel. We started last year. We've kind of broken it into sort of mini-series, and today we're beginning one of those. It's called The King Has Come. And, you know, from the 8th chapter to here we are in the 11th chapter today, there has been a process of discovery and, and disclosure as Jesus has revealed himself to his disciples. Uh, he, of course, did all those miracles, but on, at that important moment on Caesarea Philippi, Peter says, you're the Christ, you're the king. But from that moment on, it becomes clear that even Jesus' closest disciples don't understand the kind of Christ, the kind of king that he's going to be. They don't understand that where he's going and what he's going to do is ultimately going to lead to, of course, the cross. And it's striking in the Gospels when we read it because Jesus just plainly states it again and again to his disciples, but they still don't understand. The story that immediately precedes this in, in, in the Bible, in the, in the Gospel of Mark, is the story of Jesus healing a blind man named, uh, in, in Jericho named Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus. And, and, and the blind man ironically cries out, you're the son of David. He's blind, but he can see better than anyone else as to who Jesus' identity is. It becomes a way of telling a story in the gospel in which people are blind to the reality of who Jesus truly is. And in this scene in which Jesus makes finally his full disclosure, we get to see who he is, they still don't understand. The title of our message today, In the Name of the Lord. We pick up in verse 1 of Mark 11. As they approached Jerusalem, they're on that Jericho road, not going down but going up. That journey that would take um, so many hours and through that treacherous, windy, uh, mountainous road, they will find their way almost to Jerusalem. It says, as they approached Jerusalem, and they came to Bethphage. The word Bethphage is the name of a, of, a, of a village just there on the Mount of Olives, or just before it, and it, uh, it refers to the figs that come. And nearby is a town called Bethany, and, and both are referred to here. It says, and they came to Bethphage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives. Now, if you don't know your geography of Jerusalem, this may be hard for you to kind of understand, so let me just say to you, Jerusalem is a city that sits on hills. The, the temple sat on a, on a hill called Mount Moriah. Uh, the fortress was up Mount Zion. And the city, or the, the, the mountain, the hill that overlooked it all was the Mount of Olives, 2,600 feet above sea level. And they're getting ready to cross, coming from the east, going west, they're getting ready to cross over the Mount of Olives. When they do, they'll be able to see the beautiful city. They'll be able to see the temple. But in order for this Palm Sunday walk of Jesus to take place, something's got to happen. And so it says, as they approached, and at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, we're not told which two it was, we just don't know, but he sent them, go to the village ahead of you, and just as you enter it, You'll find a cult. A cult can refer to either um, the, the young offspring of a horse or of a donkey. And the text doesn't tell us, but we know donkeys were far more common. And so it probably refers to that here. You'll find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Now, if you're reading that and you're not real familiar with the traditions associated with not riding on animals, you may just think, well, it's young. No one's ever ridden on it yet. But that's not the point. This is a re reference to a royal prerogative. A king had an animal that no one else would be allowed to ride but a king. This is a less than subtle reference to the fact that Jesus is getting ready to ride on a, on a royal beast to show for everyone else that he is a king. No one has ever ridden, untie it, it says, and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you doing this? And I don't know, I'm reading this passage, I'm thinking, I'm sure people would ask that question. Just say, the Lord needs it, and send it back here shortly. 
By the way, you might not want to try this when you go shopping sometime, <laughs> you know, and they ask you as you walk out of the department store with the item, the Lord needs it. I'll return it shortly. I'll just wear it once. The sound goes off. Verse four. They went and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway. I don't know why in my mind I read that and I think of one of these old westerns, you know? It's this old uh, western town, you know, you come into it and it's dusty and there's old saloons sitting there and horses you know, tied up out front. That's the image in my mind. I'm not sure at all, it's at all what we should have here in the text. But they went and they found a colt outside in the street, tied at a doorway, and as they untied it, some people standing there asked, what are you doing? I read that this week, and you know what I thought to myself? I thought, you know, I should have made this whole sermon based on that question. As we gather here in this place to get today, as you're watching today, can you hear the God of heaven asking that question of you and me? What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing in your life? What are you doing with him? But here at this moment, it's obvious what's happening. What are you doing untying that colt? What are you doing? There's no understanding that what they're doing is actually a mission sent from God. What are you doing untying the colt? So they answered just as Jesus had told them. By the way, that's good advice. Answer as Jesus tells you. And the people let them go. When they brought the colt to Jesus... It says they threw their cloaks over it and sat on it. Some of us may think, well, they just didn't have a saddle, so that's just what they did. But this is a picture of homage to a king. We know that because look at the next verse. Many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the field. Have you ever heard the saying, rolling out the red carpet? Except for here, they're taking off their coats, their cloaks. Which, by the way, in the cold spring of the high altitude, altitude of Jerusalem, you would have wanted a coat on. They took it off, and they set it on the road so that Jesus could ride on it. While others spread branches they had cut in the fields, those who, by the way, that reminds us of Palm Sunday, doesn't it? Those who went ahead and those who followed shouted. Many times we read this story, we think they sang, but they shouted. There's a difference between singing and shouting, although sometimes there's not a huge difference in some forms of music. Hosanna. Save us, Lord. That great and ancient prayer. And then they quote the psalm, Psalm 118, that says, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's the title of our message today, in the name of the Lord. And then in verse 10, they say something that isn't in the psalm. They say this, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David. If we were just casual readers, we wouldn't notice that that is not saying what Jesus was saying. The coming kingdom of, quote, our father David is not a future look to what God is getting ready to do. It is a living in the past to what he did. 1,000 years previously. Oh, that things could be the way they used to be when King David was here. But when Jesus showed up on the scene, he did not come proclaiming the coming kingdom of our father David. What did he proclaim? The kingdom of God. He wasn't just the son of David. He wasn't just the Davidic restorer. He wasn't bringing the kingdom that David brought, that little tiny kingdom of Israel, he was ushering in the great kingdom of God. More than son of David, he was son of God. And that's when we realize that this crowd captivated in its frenzy by all that's taking place is blind to the reality of who Jesus is. They don't understand. But they finish, Hosanna in the highest heaven. And the text stops. And the story is over until we get to verse 11. And it's here I feel that there is a kind of, a kind of connection to this Mother's Day. It says in verse 11 that Jesus entered Jerusalem. 
he went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the 12. If you've ever read Mark's version of the story, you have to feel a little deflated. You go read Matthew's gospel, for example. It says that when Jesus came in in triumphal entry, that all of Jerusalem was astir, and everyone was asking, who is this? You read Luke's gospel, Luke's account of Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, and Luke tells us that people were saying, if we don't shout, the very rocks will cry out. There's this sense of excitement and energy. And then you read Mark, and someone called it the untriumphant entry. Because when Jesus comes finally into Jerusalem, and here all of the crowds have been crying out and singing and shouting and all of that, he finally enters into the temple, the place he'll later call my father's house. He'll look around, and he'll leave. I can't help but think, as I look at that story, a kind of, a kind of harmony with this day. As Jesus comes into Jerusalem in this moment, there's this realization that the crowds are crying out, he's the king, but no one really knows who he is, not even his disciples. There's this sense in which he is surrounded by the crowds, and yet he is alone. Have you ever felt that way in your life? Have you ever felt that way? There's all these sorts of people, but no one seems to know. No one seems to understand. I bet there's a lot of mothers that feel that way. I bet there's a lot of mothers who have felt that way. I bet there's a lot of fathers. I bet there's a lot of us in this room who at one time or another, maybe even on this day, some who aren't even here today because it's Mother's Day, and I said, you know, I'm just going to watch it because I don't even feel comfortable being in this place around other people because it's just hard, and I don't think people understand how I feel. Can I say to you today, Jesus does. He gets it. He understood that moment as he, as he walked around Jerusalem and he left in the name of the Lord. What can we learn from a story like this? Well, in just a couple of moments, I'd like to just kind of help us see some significance in this story. And I don't know if you're the kind of person that follows along with the, the outlines that we put, we print on the app and that sort of thing. But if you do, this is kind of the time to take that out and I'll walk you through this. I would be remiss today if I didn't tell you that this entire story is set within a very important setting. It is the Jewish festival known as the Passover. The Passover was one of three great Jewish festivals that happened in the city of Jerusalem. Uh, all Israelites were commanded to come to the temple and worship God at these great festivals. There was one in the fall called the Feast of Tabernacles. There were two in the spring. The first was Passover, which normally happened in late March, early April. And then Pentecost, 50 days later, that happened in the month of May. This particular scene and setting was that of the Passover. It was and had been for, in the time of Jesus, 1,500 years, if you can believe that, a way of commemorating God's great deliverance of the Israelites who had been captive slaves living in Egypt, but were delivered by the miraculous hand of God under the leadership of that famous man of the Old Testament called Moses. When finally the 10th plague had come against Egypt and Pharaoh who had said, every time Moses asked, let my people go, said no, there would be one final plague that would break the hardened heart of Pharaoh. It would be that night in the land of Egypt that death would literally come and take that of every firstborn child in Egypt. The only people who could be saved, the only people who could be spared, the only people who could be redeemed, were those who did what we see in this picture, took blood and put it over the doorposts of their house so that everyone inside the house, the whole family could be saved, but particularly the firstborn. The blood that would be put over the doorposts was a particular kind of blood. They were told on that night, on the 14th of Nisan at twilight, to take a lamb, a blemishless lamb, 
and they were to kill it, and they were to take the blood and use it, the blood of a lamb, to save the firstborn. Now that becomes for us the foreshadowing of what happens in this scene, in this story, as Jesus comes into Jerusalem for Passover. Jesus is becoming himself the lamb. There will be no one to save Jesus. He will die. He will die as a sacrifice for you and for me. The Old Testament describes this scene in Exodus chapter 12 when it says, on that same night, I will pass through Egypt and I will strike down every firstborn of both people and animals. I will bring judgment, and notice what it says, on the gods of Egypt. God was in a battle of the gods. It was a spiritual battle. I will bring judgment on the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will strike you when I strike Egypt. That word pass over comes to us in English for the first time when a few centuries ago, a British scholar by the name of William Tyndale translated for the first time the Bible into English from the original Greek and Hebrew at a time when it was against the law to have an English Bible. William Tyndale will pay for it with his life, but when he comes to this passage, he for the first time uses that phrase, pass over. Previously, for centuries, Jewish people and Christian people had referred to this by a different name. They had called it by the, by the Greek name Pascha. In fact, no one ever called it Easter. They called the whole week Pascha week. It was a celebration of that ancient festival. And so in this moment, for the first time, we refer to this as the Passover. Can I ask you today... Has the blood of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God, been applied not to the doorpost of your house, but to the doorpost of your life? Are you covered, as the old preacher said, by the blood of the Lamb? That's part of this story, and that's part of the picture in this story, but it doesn't explain to us what happens in this passage, which is, why is it that the crowd will suddenly start shouting that Jesus is the king? Where does that come from? Well, that comes from not the Passover imagery, but the fact that there was a great prophecy. There are actually two great prophecies of the Old Testament that helps capture this, this scene for us. In fact, I'd like for us to look at this scene again. You can look up here and see there's a depiction of Jesus riding on a colt. Uh, you can see people who are standing on this narrow, busy street holding the various things that they had gotten along the way, and it helps give us a picture of what is happening in this moment. Why do these, these pilgrims on their way to Passover suddenly think that Jesus could be the coming king? Well, you have to understand two great prophecies of the Old Testament to understand this well. One of them is found in the first book of the Bible called, yeah, Genesis, that's right. You guys are really getting this today. When the patriarch of all Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and then Jacob, whose name is also Israel, had a son that was not loved by his brothers and was therefore sold into slavery in Egypt named Joseph, would live in Potiphar's house and then in Potiphar's prison and then would be raised to be prince of Egypt and then savior of his people when rescuing his brothers and his father from the plague that befell them. A strange irony of coincidence. He would then stand before his father about to die. Jacob, Israel, would reach out his hands and he would bless each son by name. Which, by the way, we sang about that today. Fathers and mothers in this room, I hope you'll take the opportunity in your life to bless your children and your grandchildren. Words have power beyond themselves. We know that because 2,000 years ago, Jacob reached out his son and he reached out his hand and touched each of his sons and spoke words. And when he got to Judah, he said this in Genesis chapter 49, verse 10. The scepter will not depart from Judah, nor the ruler's staff from between his feet, 
that the guy that has a scepter and a ruler's staff is a king. So he's saying, you're going to rule over the others. But then he says this, until he to whom it belongs shall come. This becomes a messianic prophecy. In early Jewish synagogues, when they would gather and read this text, they understood this to be prophetic, that one day God would fulfill the great promise and blessing that out of the tribe of Judah would come a king who would have the staff. But look what it says. Until he to whom it belongs shall come and the obedience of the nations shall be his. Somebody will say, well, that refers to David. He was from the tribe of Judah. But David was only a ruler of the region. He was only a ruler of the nation. This passage speaks of a king from the line of Judah who will be the king of kings, the the ruler of the nations. And then look what it says. He will tether his donkey to a vine. Now, you're one of those people walking into Jerusalem, coming to that great celebration of Passover. Maybe the Saturday before in the synagogue, the the rabbi read that verse of Scripture. And you're walking into Jerusalem, and you look, and what do you see? But you see the miracle worker of Galilee riding on a donkey. He will tether his donkey to a vine, his colt to the choicest branch. And if you don't understand the, the sim, symbolism of wealth, look what it says next. He'll wash his garments in wine, his robe in the blood of grapes. We have sayings like that, you know, like you do things with $100 bills and stuff like that. It's a picture of wealth, power. Now that verse was in their mind, but no verse more so than Zechariah 9.9. Because Zechariah 9.9 is actually referred to in this passage. Zechariah 9.9 is one of the latter prophets of the Old Testament. It's one of the great messianic prophecies of the Old Testament. In Zechariah 9.9 it says, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Every time you see Zion in the Bible, remember that's one of the hills of Jerusalem. It's a reference to the, to the city, to the people. Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout! What are they doing in this scene? They're shouting. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king comes to you. Righteous and victorious. Lowly and riding on a donkey. Not any donkey. On a colt. The fowl of a donkey. And these worshipers look up. And what do they see? Jesus. The king has come. Now, of all the things I want you to see in this passage to understand it today, I wanted you to know a little bit about Passover and prophecy. But because I'm a Baptist preacher and my sermons all have to start with the letter P today, the third thing I want you to see are the people. I'd be remiss today if I did not point out to you that as Jesus comes into Jerusalem on this festive day, as they're shouting and as they're singing, And they're taking their garments and they're throwing them down. They're taking leafy branches and throwing them down. By the way, you may have read that or you remember that from Palm Sunday and you think to yourself, I wonder why they did that. The, The reason they did that is because in the Old Testament, whenever they made a new king, they did that. Look at 2 Kings chapter 9 verse 13. They quickly took their cloaks and spread them under him on the bare steps. They blew a trumpet and they shouted, Jehu is king. That's how they made Jehu king is they, they put their cloaks down and they, this is the way they did You've heard of a, a Yehu. This is Jehu. Jehu the king. And the way you make him a king is you blow a trumpet, you put down your cloak. It's a way of showing homage. And that's what they do in this moment. In fact, there is a book, not in our Bibles, but in some folks' Bibles, because it's written between the Old and New Testament, a book called Maccabees. That says a similar thing. In 1 Maccabees 13, 51, it says on the 23rd day of the second month in the 171st year, the Jews entered in, entered Jerusalem with praise and palm branches, with harps and cymbals and stringed instruments and hymns and songs. Because a great enemy had been crushed and removed from Israel. It was the time of the Maccabean revolt and the return 
of the Maccabean kingship in the city of Jerusalem. And what they did is they celebrated it like that. So as Jesus is coming into Jerusalem, they're wondering, is he coming to defeat the enemies? Is he coming to be the king that we've been hoping for? But they would have no idea that by the end of the week, he would be on a cross. Not saving them from the enemies of the Roman Empire, but saving humanity from sin. Not being the Lord like they thought, but the lamb that would be killed. Now, the, the psalm that permeates this whole passage is Psalm 118, 25, and 26. And it says this. This is the Old Testament. It's one of the great Hallel songs. The songs of shouting. The songs of rejoicing. As the pilgrim makes their way into Jerusalem, they say, Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. It's the title of our message. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. We come to the end of the passage. We come to the end of the message. We come to the moment. Jesus is coming to Jerusalem, and folks, it's been a celebration unlike any other. He goes into the temple. He looks around, and he leaves. It's sort of untriumphant. It's sort of lonely. It's sort of sad. It's sort of a strange way to end the story. You know, something that's interesting is the phenomenon that we sometimes see with, with famous people. Famous people sometimes describe how everyone knows them, but they feel so alone. I, I remember hearing about this guy, had kind of funny white hair, wrote some weird equation, something about E equals MC something. I mean, you know I'm talking about, he's not like he's some kind of Einstein or something, but Einstein said, interestingly, it is strange to be known so universally, yet be so lonely. I wonder if that's how Jesus felt. I wonder if you've ever felt that way. This church, First Baptist Church, was started in 1861. Two months later, the entire nation was in a civil war. The president of the United States was a man named Abraham Lincoln. Two years into that civil war, Lincoln described himself being so alone in the White House. Uh, he went to the Lord in prayer, if you know Lincoln's story. And in March of that year, 1863, as our nation found itself in the midst of its most bitter and bloody war, on March 30th of that year, he called the nation to prayer. This week, our nation had our national day of prayer. In March of that year, he called for what he called a day of national humiliation, fasting, and prayer. Can I read to you that proclamation? The awful calamity of civil war, which now desolates the land, Lincoln wrote, may be but a punishment inflicted upon us for our presumptuous sins. The president is a preacher in this moment, isn't he? to the needful end of our national reformation as a whole people. Do you hear what he's saying? He's saying maybe this has happened. All these bad things have happened because God is trying to get our attention because he's trying to get us right with him. He described the circumstance. He said that intoxicated with unbroken success, we, we being the American people, have become too self-sufficient to feel the necessity of redeeming and preserving grace. Too proud to pray, too proud to pray to the God that made us. We've grown in numbers, wow, if Lincoln only knew, right? Wealth and power as no other nation has grown. And this is the line I will not forget, you'll catch the irony of that in a moment. He says, but we have forgotten God. Isn't that something? In the midst of the shouts and the celebration, the crowd is, king has come. <laughs> but they've forgotten God. They missed him. Is it possible that on this day and in this room or as you're watching, that that's you. 
that in the midst of your life, God has blessed and given, he's taken, he's given, but in the midst of it all, and even in this very moment, perhaps you too have forgotten him. Wouldn't it be great on this day if we said, you know what? We're gonna turn our attention back to him. We're gonna say in the name of the Lord, the king that came is the king that's coming. The king that came to redeem is the one who will return to reign. And in this moment, we turned our hearts toward him. And the Bible says we would hear from heaven and he would heal our land. What if that could happen? Well, we can pray and ask God to do that. Would you join me in praying that prayer? Father, on this day and in this moment, we make this room and this place a sanctuary, an altar in which we humbly come before you, the great God that too often we have forgotten. The God who loves us, who made us, who created us, who saved us, and even now blesses us with the opportunities that are beyond our description. But Lord, so many of us, if we're honest, we've forgotten you, maybe not with our words, but with our lives and with our actions. And in this very room, you're calling us back to yourself. And in this very time, God, would you move? Would you move in this room? Would you move wherever people are listening? Would you move? Would you move, God, in Jesus' name?